Today, we're looking at an aircraft that was built with somewhat old school thinking, but still managed to outlive other models that were later designed to replace it. This was the Curtiss SOC Seagull. In the early 1930s, the US Navy was looking for a new catapult launched observation plane to replace the Vought O2U and O3U float planes. And in answer to a new specification, they received submissions from Vought, Douglas, and Curtis in early 1933. The design submitted by Curtis appeared to be a throwback to the 1920s, at least on first appearance. Their prototype model, the Model 71, which would later be known as the XO3C1, was an equal span biplane design with moderate wing stagger. The fuselage was constructed of welded steel tube framing, and although it was covered with aluminium panelling on the front, the rear was clad in fabric. The wings too were covered in fabric, and they were built on an aluminium frame with fabric covered control surfaces. As with most aircraft of this type, these wings could be folded back against the fuselage for shipboard storage. The prototype had a pair of open cockpits for the pilot and the observer, something that was rapidly falling out of fashion by this time, and it featured an amphibious landing gear that retracted into the large single float. As it was to serve at sea, and possibly also crash at sea, the crew had a fair amount of kit on board. A life raft was stowed under the pilot's seat, a first aid kit was stowed under the rear gun, a tool kit was on the forward side of the firewall, and a watertight map case was on the lower port side of the front cockpit, and both crew members of course had a flare gun. The features that could be considered modern on the plane were relatively few. It had full span leading edge slats on the upper wing, trailing edge flaps on the upper wing as well, and a streamlined cowling around the engine, which was a 9-cylinder Pratt & Whitney Wasp that produced approximately 500 horsepower. And as far as modern things go, that was about it. Although aspects of the Curtis prototype could be considered basic, or even outdated, this did not represent any sort of regression in their design thinking. In a time of American isolationism and reduced budgets, courtesy of the Great Depression, Curtis designers knew they needed a plane that was cheap to build, relatively modern, and sturdy enough for a life at sea. And so they made their design modern where it needed to be, with the new control surfaces improving the aircraft's low speed handling, and cheap where it could afford to be, having most of it covered in fabric and made from basic materials. This design approach paid off, as after competing in trials against the Douglas and Vought prototypes, the Curtis prototype was deemed the overall winner, and the company was awarded a contract for 135 production aircraft. The aircraft was first built as the Curtis X-03C1, but then this was updated to the SOC1 after approximately 6 months. This change in designation followed the merging of the scouting and observation roles for ship-launched aircraft. Previously, observation types were deployed on battleships, and scouting types were deployed on cruisers. Now they performed both roles. Compared to the prototype, there were some improvements made to the production model. Firstly, a large canopy was added that enclosed both cockpits, and this was streamlined into the tail by a collapsible turtle deck that could be lowered to allow the rear gunner a clear field of fire. The production model also featured a more powerful version of the Wasp engine, now producing 550 horsepower, and the engine now had a full NACA style cowling. Changes were also made to the undercarriage. The amphibious unit was removed, and production models would either come with a standard float for use aboard ships, or a fixed undercarriage for use aboard carriers or when deployed to coastal airfields. Deliveries of the first SOC-1s began on November the 12th, 1935, with the light cruiser USS Marblehead being the first ship to officially receive its aircraft. In terms of operational use, with the exception of carriers, all SOCs operated on a single float and were launched from shipboard catapults while at sea. After completing a mission, the recovery process was rudimentary but effective. The ship would make a large sweeping turn by which the ship's wake would produce a relatively calm area of sea for the plane to land upon. Once on the water, the pilot would taxi alongside the ship, which would be towing along a so-called plane trap, which was basically a giant reinforced net. 
The plane had a rearward angled bar that acted like a hook underneath the float, so that when it came up over this net, the pilot simply had to power down for the plane to be caught. The observer would then attach a hook that was lowered down by the ship, and the plane could be hauled up. Multiple versions of the SOC-1 would be built during the 1930s. After the completion of the initial production order for 135 SOC-1s, an order for 40 land base SOC-2s was placed. Aside from the fixed landing gear, this model also had another improved version of the WASP engine, this one being the R1240-22. And not long after this, an order of 83 SOC-3s was placed. These were identical to the SOC-2, but their landing gear was designed to be easily interchangeable with a float. Additionally, some versions of these two models were later used for carrier operations, and they would be known as the SOC-2A and 3A respectively. The last three SOC-3s from the production order were modified and given to the US Coast Guard as the SOC-4. However, these were later reacquired by the Navy in 1942 and modified to SOC-3As. To comply with a naval policy to build 10% of its own service aircraft, 64 SOCs were ordered from the Naval Air Factory. These were generally equivalent to the SOC-3, but they were designated as the SON-1 and then later the SON-1A for the aircraft modified to again operate on carriers. The SOC was not known as the Seagull until 1941, when it became commonplace for the Navy to adopt popular names as an addition to the aircraft's official designation. However, by mid-1941, all battleship observation squadrons had now been equipped with the newer Vought OS-2U, and most Seagulls were in reserve units. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor, things quickly changed. The SOCs were quickly pressed back into frontline service, with almost all cruisers in the US Navy operating the plane in 1942. A new type of operation for the aircraft began in 1941, when several SOC-3s were converted to the SO-3A for carrier use. The first 12 of these served with Brewster Buffaloes aboard the first escort carrier, USS Long Island. By late 1942, four other escort carriers were operating the Seagull in the Pacific, and they were also operated by the USS Charger in the Atlantic. Their return to service life was partly due to the war, but also due to the fact that the Seagull had managed to remain superior to the aircraft designed to replace it. By the spring of 1938, the production of the Seagull had ended, as work had already begun on a monoplane scout aircraft to replace it. However, this new plane, the Curtis SO-3C, proved to be a colossal disappointment, and its hasty withdrawal from service kept the old Seagulls relevant until 1945. Ultimately, 322 Seagulls would be produced, and they would see service in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, as well as the Mediterranean. Generally, they were very well liked by both their pilots and the crews that serviced them. Unfortunately, no example of this naval workhorse can be found today, which is a shame as it's an often underappreciated plane. As always, thank you all very much for watching, and a big thank you of course goes out to the patrons. I will get this list updated and the shoutouts for the Wing Commander tier patrons sorted as soon as I get back from my holiday, but thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.